So, ladies and gentlemen, for the sake of those of you who were punctual, I think we'll start. It's uh, three minutes past. And uh, a very good morning, Frankfurt. A very good morning also to our guests from 12 countries around the world. Today, Frankfurt is again one more hour ahead of London. Let's make the best of it. You made the right decision this morning to join us. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 26th Financial Center Breakfast in cooperation with our partners, the Association of Foreign Banks in Frankfurt. A big thank you for our partner. Ladies and gentlemen, the last 11 months were absolutely carnival about the Bitcoin. The price has now been going about $50,000, giving it an aggregate in well in excess of $1 trillion. BNY Mellon started handling Bitcoin, MasterCard, integrated it in, in, into its payment system, and Tesla bought it for corporate treasury. We just wait for central banks to make it part of the reserve currency. The digital currency is an increasing part of the modern financial landscape. Behind such a boom is people's huge divergent views on Bitcoin in particular and crypto assets in general. And here I quote the Financial Times. For some, it's a technical revolution, a highly appreciated asset, a hedge against monetary depreciation and rebuke to the financial system. For others, it's a fraud, an object of manipulation and a way to separate the unsuspected from the money. Only one thing is commonly agreed. When we are developing the European capital market, It requires that rules are applied consistently across the boards. Crypto assets are a particular area where coordination, a centralized approach are warranted. And I'm quoting here Valdis Dombrovsky, the EU commissioner and executive vice president for economic policy. Today, we're delighted to have Jan Seisens, the head of digital finance unit at the European Commission, his topic, is the regulation of crypto assets and services. Mr. Sison has worked at the European Commission since 2006, initially in the Directorate General for Competitions, Cartel Enforcement, and since 2009 in the Internal Markets and the Services Directorate General. He was member and deputy head of the cabinet of Vice President Dabrowski and member of the cabinet of Vice President Barnier and team leader for financial services at the European Commission's Internal Markets and Services Direct General. He graduated in law from the Humboldt University in Berlin, holds a master degree in European law from King's College in London. The audience, as always, please feel free to input your questions during and after the speech in Zoom. The presentation will be made available for yourself. We record this session. And if you want to share any comments and thoughts throughout the presentation, feel free to go on social media. And it's highly appreciated if you use the name tag at FMF Digital and hashtag Virtual Food for Thought. Mr. Sizes. We are all looking forward. We have a record number of registrations and I think you hit the nail on the head with your topic. Appreciate that you're here this morning. Thank you. Yeah, good morning at Frankfurt. Um, good morning, uh, everybody. Um, indeed, uh, you are not only one hour ahead of London, but you also still have the sun while here in Brussels, where I'm based, uh, it is already raining. So uh, I think many, many uh, actually uh, plus points for Frankfurt. and. Uh, so um, I appreciate, of course, all the more that uh, all the interest that you have in the in the question of crypto uh, assets regulation and uh, actually the latest uh, commission proposals on this matter. And I'm very, very uh, uh, keen indeed to present you our proposals uh, this morning and then uh, to uh, get views, comments, criticism, suggestions on this uh, and really to engage in a, in a discussion. I think uh, we are Uh, let's say probably the specialist on the regulation of this, uh, but uh, many of you are, uh, you know, the markets and I think the two things uh, uh, always will have to go hand in hand. So uh, this dialogue is really very important for me and for us. And thank you very much indeed uh, to Mr. Fat and Frankfurt Mine Finance actually to, uh, to organize this. 
I have prepared a couple of slides and I will try to uh, put them up. Um, I hope and think it will it is visible. I will um, maybe take a st start by taking a step back uh, to uh, tell why the EU is actually looking at uh, crypto assets regulation. Um, and then I will uh, shortly present you the proposals which the commission has actually made last September in the context of our digital finance package. So uh, let's start. Um, one second. Um, I think I need to. One second. Yes, exactly. Does it work? Exactly. Okay, there we go. It seems to be working. Uh, if there are troubles in understanding or in uh, watching, please uh, please let me know. So, what's the context of our uh, our work on this? Um, indeed, uh, our uh, president of the European Commission, Mrs. von der Leyen, uh, um, has uh, already said uh, last uh, in September in her speech on the state of the European Union that uh, this is actually Europe's digital decade, and uh, she has put out the ambition that Europe must now lead indeed the way on digital, or it will have to follow others who are setting the standards uh, for us. Uh, and that is, I think, uh, uh, the very broad uh, in ambition indeed we have from the European Commission. Uh, in across the economy in many different parts of the economy, but also in finance indeed uh, to uh, to update our rules uh, to uh, to make sure that we we set the right standards in this uh, in this area um, and to complement that indeed uh, on the other on the other hand regulation is one point financing of digital innovation is another point so indeed the digital euro program uh, uh, is indeed uh, can now finally start working actually now that uh, the, the European multi-annual financial rules uh, have been agreed. Um, so there will be a lot of support, a lot of funding in this uh, in this area actually, and of course the broader work on skills and on uh, on uh, on digital education is, is a, a third pillar, I think. That's probably the three pillars we, from our perspective, need to work on. It's basically, the, uh, it's, uh, it's investment, it is skills, and it is indeed the, the regulation. Today we're focusing in, on the regulation, but uh, the other elements are as, uh, as important as, uh, as that one. Um, so, uh, where do we stand on digital finance? Indeed, digital finance is part of the broader digital agenda, and indeed, as you know, uh, in the uh, in the uh, uh, in the digital age, actually, the, the the boundaries between different sectors of the economy are more and more blurring. Um, so, we are trying to uh, address as many uh, issues as possible in the digital economy across sectors, actually. And I think the uh, recent uh, proposal for a digital markets act from the European Commission uh, to regulate large platforms is one. One aspect uh, important for finance, important for many other parts of the of the economy, and we're looking at this across sectors. However, of course, digital finance it's digital, but it's also still finance uh, with all the uh, both opportunities, but also risks which uh, uh, which are uh, actually uh, linked to it. Um, on the one hand, uh, digital finance it creates a lot of opportunities for consumers and businesses. Um, in terms of new access to financing, uh, we've seen under COVID-19 how much we need actually the digital access to finance to continue to continue working. Uh, and for many SMEs and other companies, this has really uh, kept up the, up the lifeline they, they needed. Um, uh, on the other hand, digital finance, of course, or the digital transformation is also changing finance fundamentally and bringing also new, uh, new risks. Uh, that's something which we need to, of course, also closely, uh, closely watch. Um, digital finance can, from our perspective, support indeed uh, the twin transition in which we are, uh, which, which we are, and uh, which has been accelerated through the COVID-19 situation, the Green Deal, and the uh, digital agenda, and our broader industrial uh, strategy. Actually, all this requires a lot of financing. Uh, the finance sector is key here, and uh, digital finance provides many new opportunities. Um, the last point I want to make here is that uh, digital finance is inherently cross-border. Digital, digital actually in general and the single market can only go hand, uh, hand in hand. Uh, many uh, solutions in the digital age uh, can only be scaled, can only be made profitable if they are deployed across uh, a, a large market. And even Germany as the largest uh, market in Europe is probably too small for many of those solutions. So digital Europe can really only have a leading role in digital uh, if it scales across the, uh, the internal market. Um, and in that sense, indeed, uh, we have seen when we consulted ahead of our proposals, we've seen actually 
uh, very broad support for for more EU action in this uh, in this area of digital finance, even among other players who maybe otherwise are more critical towards the stronger role of Europe. I think in this area, uh, everybody is clear, this needs to be looked at together. And digital finance, of course, it can also has the potential to strengthen indeed the banking union, the capital markets union. You know, uh, we have been working since a long time to uh, better integrate actually European uh, financial markets and uh, the, uh, the potential which digital means of access, of course, have to uh, allow consumers to shop across borders, to allow SMEs actually to finance across borders are, are quite clear and, and huge to everybody. So this is really, in, in a nutshell, something where uh, we need to work together uh, inherently cross-border. Now, what uh, have we? What are we proposing actually to to uh, promote digital finance in Europe, but also to, uh, uh, of course, regulate its risks? Uh, we have had a broad outreach uh, last spring, actually, events across many many member states, uh, uh, discussions with stakeholders, consultations, and I think a number of you may have uh, contributed to that. Um, and on that basis, we had uh, set out a, a strategy for digital finance in, uh, uh, from the European Commission for the next four or five years. So for this mandate of the European Parliament as well, um, where we really have put out the ambition indeed that uh, Europe should be among the leading uh, uh, jurisdictions across uh, the board, in, uh, across the globe in, the, in digital finance, and that we want to actually support and uh, promote digital finance in Europe to play a, a leading role indeed. Um, and we have put out four priorities where we see that action from our side can actually uh, uh, support this objective. Now, the first one is um, to tackle fragmentation in the digital single market. Rules are still very uh, different in, in many instances uh, from one member state to the other. And I think the topic we have today, crypto assets, is a clear case in point. Uh, so by actually uh, harmonizing, make, uh, creating common rules, indeed, we can uh, 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 enable uh, firms actually to make uh, use of this large single market which we have to actually develop digital solutions. Now, I think this, the second priority is to make sure that our regulatory framework facilitates digital innovation. You know that finance is, and I mentioned that before, and you know it all, uh, subject to a, a large host of regulation because of the inherent risk it poses. Much of this is European regulation. Uh, and of course, if our regulatory framework is not uh, fit does not work in the digital age, we have a problem. So uh, indeed, we need to make sure this is not the case. And again, the crypto asset proposals we're discussing about today are a key uh, case in point. Our third priority is the creation of a European financial data space. Uh, data is clearly uh, uh, the new oil, not for the uh, only for the economy at large, but also for the financial sector. And in that sense, uh, uh, we want to promote and uh, uh, support, indeed, uh, uh, data-driven uh, business models, data sharing, and other methods. And the fourth uh, priority we have is, of course, also to address new risks arising with uh, the digitalization of uh, our finance. And uh, in particular, we have put out a proposal uh, uh, on the digital operational resilience of the financial sector to make sure that, indeed, uh, uh, cyber risks are addressed by all parts of the financial uh, sector and that uh, actually users, uh, consumers, companies can be sure that if their finance goes digital, this does not mean increased risk of hacking of fraud or other risks. Maybe. And of course, cross-cutting on this is indeed our objective to create opportunities for and to protect uh, consumers. So that's a bit the big picture. And uh, uh, I wanted to still start with this because it sets the frame in a way for the proposals on uh, crypto assets, uh, which we are discussing today. But let's now get uh, uh, to, uh, to, to the uh, area of crypto assets. Um, what are the objectives of the specific uh, legislative proposals which we presented together with this digital finance strategy? So those are two proposals indeed uh, for regulations which are now being discussed actually in the uh, Council of Ministers and the European Parliament. You know that both will have to agree on these rules before they actually become law. Uh, now, the objectives, uh, and we got that clearly from various consultations, also from advice we got from the European supervisory authorities and from discussions with member states. Uh, crypto assets is an area where there's a lack of legal certainty, which holds back very often actually uh, the development of, uh, uh, of products. Um, we want to support innovation, but also we need to uh, protect consumers. I think the uh, uh, the developments in uh, around Bitcoin in, in, in recent uh, weeks and months indeed uh, have, have uh, also highlighted that this is a more and more broader issue. We need to make sure that markets are not rigged, that there, uh, there's a strong level of market integrity. We need to make sure, and that applies particularly to larger arrangements, that uh, uh, um, crypto assets do not undermine financial stability. 
and that they do not present risks to monetary policy transmission. And this, I think, particularly relevant, of course, for the uh, uh, so-called stable coins. Um, so how do we get about these, uh, to achieve these objectives? Uh, we have presented two uh, proposals, indeed, as I mentioned. One is the regulation for markets and crypto assets, called uh, shortly Mika. Uh, and here uh, we are for the first time indeed setting up a common European framework to regulate uh, both issuers and, uh, uh, and, um, uh, and service providers uh, um, uh, on crypto assets. However, only to the extent that they are not covered by the existing uh, EU legislation. So you know, uh, let's say the scope of MIFID, you know the scope of PSC2 and others. Uh, uh, so those uh, rules are there, they remain in place and a certain amount of crypto assets actually fall in their scope. You are aware of that. Uh, projects have been approved by regulators. Uh, if that is the case, uh, that continues to be uh, applicable. If you uh, issue a security, it's not just because you put it on the blockchain that you should be subject to a different set of rules. Um, however, uh, indeed, the Mika framework is supposed to cover all those activities, all those assets which are not covered by the existing regulation, and in that sense, for example, uh, are covered uh, by the, um, uh, by the uh, recent law on, on crypto uh, assets, actually, which also was adopted in Germany. Uh, we have seen similar initiatives in France and Malta, and uh, I think all member states, however, have been clear that uh, in the end, uh, all those national initiatives, they would need to actually ultimately uh, um, end up into a common European uh, set of rules. Why does that make sense? I think I said it already, but uh, want to, to highlight it again. Uh, uh, first of all, it's about legal certainty. Second, it's about the passport, basically. If you, uh, if you have common European rules, it means, well, maybe you will not like all the rules, maybe they may be a bit stricter here and there, but it means once you, apply, you uh, comply with the rules, once you have an authorization in one member state, you can actually market your services across 27 uh, member states. And I think that's the big uh, plus and the big pro indeed of these common European rules also for the market. Mr. Seisen, so, so sorry to briefly, sorry to briefly interrupt you. Please, please. I think, I think first of all, I'd, I'd like to ask a question, but uh, I, this question serves the purpose. <laughs> this question serves the purpose because there are two black blocks on your presentation, and we figured out what the technical reasons for that are. If you would be so kind to withdraw your presentation, we will display it from our end. Okay. And my colleague will make sure it's going to be shown. It's it's still okayish, but but it is a little bit of a hindrance in no, seeing no, the no. presentation. Pres 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 uh, yeah. We don't want to have black box, uh, and, boxes in on yeah. our presentation. And while and whilst he put it whilst he put it up, or a little question at that point: Would you see at the moment? risk from stable coins so is is that regulation actually driven from a from a, a risk assessment which you which you have made and what are those risks which you're seeing at the moment yeah um no thanks very much for the for the question and uh, um uh i mean we so I, 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 we, so as, as I mentioned, our, our framework is, is a broader framework indeed for crypto assets uh, as, at large, basically, and there are many uh, items here. Uh, one indeed are the so-called stable coins, and uh, uh, thanks very much for, for, for pointing to them. I think uh, the DM uh, Libra project uh, uh, is, 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 a, is a particular case in point here. Uh, so those are uh, indeed crypto assets which are actually referenced to uh, a certain uh, stable uh, value or backed by, by assets indeed, uh, re relation to a currency, for example, or a commodity. So in that sense, they are, of course, uh, on the one hand, uh, they are, um, let's say, tokens which uh, promise uh, more stability than this would be the case, for example, uh, with Bitcoin or other uh, normal crypto assets. Because indeed there is this backing indeed and this reference to a uh, let's say if you want traditional uh, asset actually, um, and by this promise of course also those uh, stable coins uh, uh, also aim at uh, fulfilling functions in the in the payments area uh, in many instances and and uh, that is of course something where then indeed uh, additional uh, concerns arise and additional issues have to be to be addressed and uh, this is why both. And I think in Europe, the finance ministers, but also across the globe, the G20, the G7, the Financial Stability Board actually have uh, highlighted that a particular focus, particular, uh, uh, let's say, uh, attention is needed in this area. One, to make sure that if uh, stable coins are used for payment purposes, uh, that indeed uh, the, uh, let's say, the, 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 the traditional objectives of payments regulation in terms of, again, uh, ensuring st stable and efficient payment systems are, are, are met. 
Um, and uh, and uh, second, indeed, to make sure that if those stable coins were to become actually very large and uh, uh, very very widely used, and that is, I think, where indeed the, the combination of stable coins with uh, social platforms such as uh, Facebook probably raises particular attention. That in these situations, one also has to see well what is what will be the financial stability and monetary policy impact actually of such a uh, large, a very large, potentially very large uh, stable coin or global stable coin. So I think those are the two uh, particular, uh, I mean, uh, risks we see. There's a particular benefit because uh, there's a promise of strong stability. That of, the promise, of course, needs to be under underpinned. And then, of course, if that promise of stability leads to a widespread use in the payments area, that means also that there are particular uh, risks which are inherent in actually payment systems. And if if uh, those stable coins become actually very large, uh, there are also questions and uh, issues in relation to financial stability and monetary policy. So these are the particular issues in relation to stable coins, which uh, the Mika regulation, the proposal also addresses, and I'll come to that in a moment how this works. First of all, just one, uh, uh, let's say, further uh, uh, sentence indeed on our DLT uh, pilot uh, regime, which is the second proposal. Uh, now we're moving indeed to the area of those uh, uh, crypto assets which are covered today by the existing rules, so which are financial instruments under MIFID. Or, or other uh, um, uh, matters. And uh, here in principle, as I mentioned, we think existing rules are fit for purpose, they can apply. However, we've seen certain areas where there are question marks. Our consultation has pointed out that maybe DLT uh, um, uh, may have raised certain challenges in terms of compliance. And that's why we're actually proposing with a sandbox type approach, indeed, uh, the possibility in small scale actually to uh, to with uh, between authorities and market players actually to experiment with certain uh, uh, with certain instruments and uh, get to gain experience indeed gain evidence about possible obstacles to the application of DLT. So this is in a nutshell actually our our proposals and our package. I will now, if you can move then to the next slide, I will uh, try to uh, uh, have just six, seven slides about the, uh, the, the key elements of the two proposals, uh, and I will try to go through, uh, lead you briefly to them. Uh, indeed, here you see that in our Mika proposal, uh, uh, we have set up a, a rather general taxonomy of crypto assets. We think it's not wise to go in very, very much detail because uh, legislation, as you know, is by, by nature uh, st uh, static and you can't change it uh, every other month. And uh, this uh, environment is, is a quite dynamic one. So we should not get uh, into too much detailed actually legislative uh, differentiation, but still there's the overall in a way um, uh, taxonomy we have, which are the general crypto assets covering, for example, utility tokens covering, uh, covering Bit, uh, Bitcoin and others. Um, uh, where we indeed have a, uh, pr proposed a broad uh, definition, actually, in line also with the international recommendations of FATF on anti-money laundering, uh, and those are covered by general rules of Mika. Then, indeed, we have the asset reference tokens uh, and e-money tokens, which I think uh, in the broader sense are the stable coins we just uh, actually uh, refer to. Asset reference tokens, indeed, meaning a type of crypto assets that purports to maintain a stable value by referring to the value of several fiat currencies uh, or commodities or crypto assets. Um, and indeed, then the electronic money tokens, uh, which indeed uh, are also re referencing an asset, but a particular one, namely one single currency. And in that sense, are very close indeed what we to know today as e-money, uh, and which is today uh, covered by the e-money uh, directive, basically. Uh, so those are also asset reference tokens and e-money tokens covered by Mika, but with specific rules, because indeed here there are, in, for e-money tokens, certainly, for asset reference tokens, potentially there can be a uh, use for payment purposes. So additional actually uh, rules and safeguards are necessary. And then indeed we have, of course, as I mentioned, the third category, crypto assets, which are financial instruments today. They are not covered by Mika. They are covered by the existing, uh, uh, the existing um, uh, rules uh, which exist. And uh, we will promote consistency of application across the EU here. Uh, and we have indeed this DLT pilot. If we can then move to the next slide. So uh, I, I will focus mainly then here indeed uh, for the next slide indeed on the significant asset reference tokens and e-money tokens. Maybe just before that one word on the on the normal actually crypto assets uh, here indeed this is an area which is today not subject to regulation. So uh, issuers of normal crypto assets do not have any requirements today. We think that in the future some limited requirements uh, are necessary to bring this in the regulated space. In particular. There need to be some basic requirements for the white paper, which uh, these projects with normal crypto assets actually issue. 
uh, which needs to be issued, which needs to be clear, which needs to be informative, and uh, and so that investors indeed know what they are what they are buying. And that is, uh, I think, uh, the basic requirement we have in here. But for the rest, indeed, this is an area which is uh, relatively not regulated today, and we bring this slowly in the regulated space. If we're talking about indeed uh, um, asset reference tokens and in particular significant asset reference tokens and e-money tokens, there, as I mentioned, we have uh, uh, stricter proposed stricter rules. Uh, the European Banking Authority actually, uh, because those items will likely be used across the EU, can classify indeed uh, uh, such tokens as significant. Um, um, and, uh, uh, and that means indeed, uh, based on a number of uh, criteria, basically, um, and that means then indeed, if we can move to the next uh, slide, um, that means indeed that then also particular rules would uh, would apply. So uh, we have here again uh, an overview of the uh, different rules, regulation and supervision of the different uh, crypto assets. Indeed, we have the normal crypto assets, no prior authorization, but we're suggesting uh, indeed that a white paper needs to be done. Uh, there needs to be, there are general obligations in terms of uh, actually uh, fa fairness and honesty, uh, but no specific supervision actually of the crypto asset issuer, only ad hoc powers indeed for the supervisors. Then we have indeed the asset reference tokens, uh, where indeed there are stricter requirements, including particular, of course, on the reserve and the own fund. If you are claiming actually that your asset is backed by a reserve, you need uh, this needs to be backed up. This needs to be supervised. This needs to be actually uh, made sure that this is actually the case. I think that has traditionally not always been the case in the, uh, the case of some of some of those tokens. So this is something where indeed uh, actually uh, uh, rules are necessary. If, if those asset reference tokens actually become significant, so they become potentially widely used, last spread, large largely spread indeed, there can be higher requirements, um, and there can uh, be actually there will be a supervision by a European authority. And very similar requirements indeed we have for e-money tokens. However, here again, uh, because that is an area which will be very, very likely used as uh, mainly as payment uh, instruments, we have stricter requirements and in particular actually a one-to-one -one redemption right. That means if you buy your token for one euro, at any moment you can actually redeem it with the issuer at the price of one uh, euro. And that's, I think, essential for uh, the broader use in, in the area of payments, uh, basically, because uh, of course payment users need to know, uh, or if, if payment users have a doubt about the stability of the payment instrument, that can then put payment uh, systems into strains very, very easily if there is a, a crisis situation. And again, we have additional rules on significant, uh, uh, let's say, providers. And then we come to the crypto asset service uh, providers. Uh, so we have indeed rules for the issuers. They are very important, but in this uh, uh, crypto asset ecosystem, of course, the service providers, the providers of wallet services, the providers of trading venues, etc., are equally relevant, equally important. And in that sense here, this is an area which is already covered in Germany via the crypto, uh, um, um, crypto uh, um, law, which is called, I think, uh, crypto, crypto Werte Gesetz. Um, so here we are indeed proposing harmonized rules uh, and the passport indeed also for providers. Again, authorization requirements, requirements, governance and governance and own funds, and indeed a, a supervision by the national competent authority. I see there were a couple of questions actually um, in terms of liability. I think on the uh, uh, on the white paper, indeed we would have a liability for the white paper in a similar way if you want, as you know it from the prospectus uh, regulation. And I think there was another question I saw in the how chat. Do you how do you distinguish between e-money token and normal money? Exactly. That was the second question I see. Um, so indeed, uh, in this area, we suggest that the, in the moment you actually you uh, issue e-money, which is based on distributed ledger technology, actually in that uh, uh, instance, you would uh, have an e-money token and you would be here subject to special rules. Why is that? because we do think that actually an, uh, an e-money token based on distributed ledger technology has quite specific features, um, uh, which uh, uh, will be subject to a quite different ecosystem actually with crypto as a service providers, et cetera, for example. Uh, and it has also much larger potential indeed to scale up to become significant. That's why uh, then compared to normal, actually traditional e-money, that's why in this case, actually uh, uh, specific and dedicated rules seem to be actually warranted. If we can then move to the next slide. Uh, so we, this is just summarizing indeed in one uh, chart uh, uh, our proposal of the crypto asset ecosystem. You have the normal crypto assets uh, with uh, just limited uh, obligation for the issuer. 
you have indeed asset reference tokens, uh, prior authorization, uh, capital requirements, requirements on the reserve. You have the e-money tokens where on top of that particular, you have a one-to-one -one redemption right, uh, very close to e-money. Uh, and then underlying this indeed, you have the rules for crypto asset service providers, for those who offer service of custody, of trading, exchange services, execution, pay, uh, placing of orders, uh, et cetera, where indeed we have an uh, authorization uh, regime and certain uh, requirements. If we can then move to the next uh, slide. So this was, I think, in a nutshell, the uh, an overview of our uh, actually uh, Mika uh, proposals on uh, crypto assets. Um, and we are then moving indeed to the DLT uh, pilot. Uh, as I mentioned, this is uh, now we'll go into the space which is already regulated today, which is subject uh, to actually MIFID in particular. Uh, and uh, the idea here is uh, that uh, we are seeing an interest in developing a secondary market for market for tokenized financial instruments. Uh, and we would like to actually test this, promote actually the uptake of DLT in, in the trading and post-trading area. Uh, and also enable market participants, but also the EU regulators to gain experience. Uh, and we want to break indeed the circle where basically uh, we are not sure there are regulatory, is regulatory uncertainty, difficulty to identify regulatory obstacles um, on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, also the market is not really developing yet fully. So we don't really know uh, what's the chicken and what's the egg. Is, is, is it a lack of actually uh, adjusted rules, which is uh, kind of holding back projects or is it a, uh, uh, is, it other, is it other things? And so the idea is indeed to gain limited experience here. If we can then move to the next uh, slide. And I see that there are further questions on Mika. I would maybe now finish on the DLT pilot and then we can come back to those questions. So um, uh, what we are proposing here is indeed that uh, DLT market infrastructures can request exemptions from the requirements in existing European legislation, MIFID, CSDR. Uh, uh, you know that unlike other jurisdictions like the US or others, we have in Europe a lot of, uh, let's say, detailed rules in our legislation. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the idea is in, indeed here to uh, have the possibility for national competent authorities actually to have exercise a bit more discretion, to uh, uh, exercise a bit more supervisory judgment in a small scale, um, uh, to, to grant certain exemptions. Uh, while the ESMA, the European Securities and Markets Authority, uh, will have to give uh, uh, opinions and will have to ensure that there is a convergence on this. Um, and of course, we need to maintain a level playing field across the EU here. So uh, exemptions are quite limited, uh, are limited to small, actually uh, less liquid markets, uh, are limited to few uh, categories of instruments, shares and bonds, and are uh, subject to additional conditions attached to it. And of course, this regime is optional in the sense that no uh, no, um, uh, no, no market operator needs to go for this. Uh, no national competent authority, no supervisor has to actually grant any exemptions. It's a possibility, basically. If we can then move to the next slide, uh, uh, just to highlight a bit more the key attributes of this. Indeed, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a quite limited pilot project because the idea is precisely to to uh, actually gain experience uh, without attaching, uh, without reaching any. Uh, uh, let's say issues which which could have financial stability dimension. So indeed, uh, shares uh, with a market uh, capitalization of the issue below 200 uh, million euros, uh, uh, and uh, bonds and uh, uh, are similarly capped below 500 million euros, and overall caps of the indeed of the size of the DLT market infrastructure. Um, we can then see indeed coming up uh, within these kind of tightly framed areas, we can we can have the possibility indeed for DLT mark MTFs and DLT uh, security settlement systems. Um, and uh, uh, the authorities would then uh, have the possibility indeed to allow for certain exemptions actually to the existing rules for those small projects, but also to, uh, uh, to actually uh, attach as a compensation if you want new measures, additional measures, uh, which would address the particular risk inherent in those uh, systems. Um, and uh, those actually exemptions, those possibilities could be granted by national competent authorities up to six years. Again, as I mentioned, this is something which is there to actually uh, to uh, to gain experience uh, and uh, then to take stock uh, uh, how the market develops. Uh, is there a case for changing our rules on a broader uh, scale or not? Uh, are there new risks arising? Uh, are maybe risks being reduced, for example, because the settlement uh, uh, settlement uh, times are being uh, limited, are being reduced because trading and settlement can take place in the same logical uh, second? Um, and uh, what is the experience we can uh, we can gain with this? If we then then get to the next uh, slide, 
actually, I think that would uh, actually finish my overview of our proposals. So again, I talked to you about uh, the general digital finance strategy of the European Commission, how this fits into the bigger picture. I presented shortly indeed the Mika proposal on markets and crypto assets, uh, which uh, covers those items which are not covered by existing rules. And I then uh, presented to you indeed uh, the, uh, the DLT pilot, which allows for experimentation at small scale actually within the existing rules. Um, and uh, I think this uh, uh, kind of concludes with the overview I, I, uh, I want to make. I think overall, as I mentioned, our objective here is, uh, is to, to provide legal certainty in this market, to make sure that the risks are addressed, uh, the risks are addressed uh, uh, to also uh, uh, provide legal uh, clarity and the regulatory system, because we know that many of those projects can really only scale up if there is indeed if they're subject to regulation, many investors will only uh, go into certain asset classes if there is, uh, 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 let's say, clear legal clarity, if there's a clear regulation. So we think really that in this area, uh, clear regulation and regulation, which is not necessarily uh, low standards, but rather strict, actually, and market development uh, can and will actually go hand in hand. And uh, so I think with this, from the European uh, perspective, I think we are also globally rather in a good place. I think we are rather ahead of the of the curve, but of course these rules are now a proposal from the European Commission. They will have to be agreed and adopted by the European uh, Parliament and by the Council of Ministers. I think the discussions there are very well underway. Um, the European, uh, uh, the Council of Ministers is well, uh, well advancing. The German presidency last year has advanced the proposals already. Now the Portuguese presidency and in the European Parliament, indeed, we have uh, Mr. Berger, who is uh, uh, the rapporteur, uh, um, also uh, uh, actually from, from, from Germany, uh, a CDU rapporteur, who also is about, I think, to produce a draft report. And so I think we are really moving ahead with this because everybody realizes it's good to have proposals on the table. It's even better if you indeed uh, uh, create the legal clarity and put them into law as quickly as possible. Excellent. Thank you so much for your very comprehensive presentation. We have got tons of questions in the meanwhile coming in. So it's, uh, it's not only very comprehensive, but it's very detailed. So let me, let me start with the first question is the stable coin. What actually makes a stable coin stable? Is it the stability in the sense of consistently reflecting the value of the underlying assets? Or is it price stability of the underlying asset itself? Indeed, uh... Actually, if you see, if you receive, we did not use the word, the term stable coin in our proposal because indeed I think it is more it is indeed a uh, very often a, a claim of the issue that there is stability and uh, one will have to examine indeed what that what that means. We have uh, called them more specifically asset reference tokens actually because I think that's probably more what it is. Indeed, it is a, a, a an asset which claims to purport a stable stable value referring to a certain asset. If that asset is, of course, the euro, that is then indeed, uh, uh, let's say, uh, um, uh, stability vis-a-vis -vis indeed uh, in, in, the, in the broader sense, uh, in, in both senses, as you mentioned. If the asset you refer to is a commodity, of course, that commodity itself will fluctuate to the official currency. And in that sense, of course, the stable coin would also fluctuate vis-a-vis -vis to the official currency. It would remain stable vis-a-vis -vis indeed the, uh, the, the, the commodity. Yeah. The another question obviously comes from a risk manager. How is crypto tokens are going to be handled under core market risk, uh, the net position in a specific token? Would it depend on the nature of the token to be treated? Or is it the, the underlying commodity equity or bonds? Or is there any extra charge? So um, actually the Basel committee uh, is right now looking at this. And I think we'll also come out shortly with a consultation indeed on the capital uh, uh, rules for banks in relation to crypto assets. I think as a general matter, uh, it's, it's useful again to uh, make the distinction between those crypto assets which are, let's say, tokenized uh, financial instruments, uh, uh, I mean, uh, which are, or maybe even traditional financial instruments, derivatives on, let's say, crypto assets or, or tokenized securities, tokenized bonds or others. And in principle, I would uh, think and expect that in principle there also the, the existing rules would apply. And then on the other hand, uh, those crypto assets, which are not uh, actually existing financial instruments. And in that sense there, of course, uh, there is, uh, let's say, uh, more uncertainty right now. But uh, the Basel Committee, this is something which is not directly covered by Mika. I think Mika aims to actually set up a, a framework actually for this, for this market and to, to make sure uh, that indeed all operators in this crypto asset universe are regulated. What, how the banking supervisors will then actually look at actually crypto asset exposures on the balance sheet of banks. 
The same thing, how insurance supervisors may in the future or asset managers uh, and their supervisors may look at the exposures actually. Uh, that is, I think, are additional matters which, uh, which uh, will have to be looked at indeed. Would you see regulation vary with the reference assets of the ART that gold would be treated different from, for example, real estate? Um, well, I think there, there would be a di big difference, for example, between gold and real estate in the sense that uh, real estate is uh, is not fungible. In that sense, actually, uh, we, we cannot expect, uh, I think, a, a trading on financial markets in the same uh, way as you would uh, expect that in a commodity. So I think a tokenized real estate is something which actually our proposals would not cover, because indeed this is a, a tokenization of a non-fungible specific right, actually, which is very important, but probably uh, then at that stage, you do not have, you do not have a need for for all the kind of uh, far-reaching uh, rules which you have in terms of market integrity uh, uh, and, and, and other matters actually to, to ensure uh, uh, protection of investors. So I think that would be the big difference. A commodity is fungible, a crypto asset linked to a commodity in that sense would be covered by our, our rules because we can expect that there potentially can be uh, actually a, a trading actually happening. The financial markets can develop actually, whereas that's not necessarily the case uh, for just tokenized uh, Uh, real estate or you can continue a tokenized uh, uh, theater ticket or a tokenized uh, any other right basically. You've already briefly touched upon where Mika stands in the global context. Are we really a first mover or even are we expecting it to replace USDT? Um, so we, I think uh, we are not, uh, I mean, Europe is not a first mover on crypto assets. I think that is, uh, that is uh, relatively clear. I think we have many interesting projects, but, uh, but we are not a first mover in the market. On the regulatory side, uh, I think we are the first uh, jurisdictions across the globe, which has presented indeed a comprehensive uh, framework, which will look at all, as uh, all aspects of this. I think if you look at the US or other jurisdictions, I think um, there are more specific, actually uh, uh, ad hoc uh, uh, indeed approaches to individual uh, items here. Um, and uh, uh, that is a, a different approach. Uh, I think it, it can create certainty in certain areas, but I think there remain always, there will always remain other areas which, where there is uh, uncertainty. I think it's, the second point is we are the first jurisdiction which actually provides a framework for actually a large number of jurisdictions. You know, even in the US, you have uh, more than 50 federal states and many of them have their separate crypto laws, basically. Okay, that's interesting. I didn't know, I didn't know that. Can you touch a little bit more on how you differ the EU risk? How do you compare to the US, UK and Asian uh, systems? So the, 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 what, what would the rules eventually also sort of want to attract as a business or distract? So I think, as as I uh, as I said, I think um, in this area, this it's not an area where you say, well, the, the the lower the rules are, the more business you attract. I think, on the contrary, I think what uh, what at least we hear from from business participants is actually that uh, this is a bit, sector which still uh, is looking in part for recognition also from the from traditional institutional investors, other investors, and in that sense, actually, a certain standard of regulation is actually necessary to actually. Uh, To, uh, to, to be actually acceptable and, and attractive also for, uh, for, for a larger set of, uh, of, of investors. With that in mind, um, how do we compare to other jurisdictions? Um, I think, uh, so the, let's start from, from those ones close to us. I think the UK um, has just issued a uh, only a consultation. They are less advanced than we. I think in terms of the relation of stable coins, this is pretty much uh, very close to what we have also proposed actually. Um, I think the UK is not currently envisaging to have uh, a, a full uh, rules on uh, service providers, actually. Um, and uh, in that sense, what, the, what Germany has already put in place with the crypto uh, uh, Werte Gesetz and what we are proposing here is something which uh, the, uh, the UK is not currently yet envisaging. Um, however, they, of course, have anti money loan rules in place. Com comparing to the US, Is, is quite hard actually, because in the US actually there's not, uh, there's still considerable uncertainty. I mean, the SEC is uh, having various uh, litigations as well on specific projects to decide what would be covered under their securities notion or not. Uh, so probably one will need to uh, wait for the outcome of those actually, those uh, uh, those matters to see what, what the situation will be. And one will have to see how the new administration actually will, uh, will look at these matters. So that's still, I think, open very much um, so to be seen. Now, are central banks actually involved in this discussion? Uh, 
with digital yes, currencies? The banks are involved in these discussions, and I think that's also one of the questions which uh, I think one of the participants asked indeed uh, uh, on the uh, role of the European Central Bank in our proposals. Uh, central banks are particularly involved indeed in the question of stable coins uh, because they could have implications for payment systems for also monetary policy transmission if they are widely used. Um, and in that sense, this is a matter of uh, great attention also from the from the central banks. Um, uh, and uh, we have indeed for that reason also for indeed these stable coins, uh, we have proposed indeed that the European Central Bank should actually would, we have to give an opinion on each of these uh, 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 these uh, projects actually before it is uh, before it is um, approved actually. Um, as uh, I think uh, one of the participants rightly pointed out, the ECB has recently uh, called to clarify that indeed uh, such an opinion would have to be binding. Uh, uh, and that uh, if the ECB says now that this uh, project actually has monetary policy, uh, raises monetary policy concerns, then it should not be authorized. Um, I, I mean, that's something we're discussing these days. I think in practice, we all uh, we are all clear and expect if a, if, if a central bank actually says, no, this uh, project raises concerns, I would not expect any supervisor actually to authorize it. So uh, in that sense, I think... Uh, this is uh, something which, uh, I mean, we're discussing the details, but, uh, but in principle, it's very clear if these stable coins uh, become, uh, I mean, significant, if they become uh, large, actually, if they re raise financial stability, monetary policy concerns, central banks need to be satisfied with them. Otherwise, they won't be able to go ahead. Yeah. We have another 10 more questions <laughs> and 10 more minutes. So I'll ask you to be okay. really concise on each and every of them. The next one is very specific. Is there a possibility to safe keep DLT transferable financial instruments at a custody bank so that an institutional investor doesn't need to go directly to DLT SSS or DLT MTF? The pilot regime doesn't foresee it set up in the proposal yet, according to the questionnaire. Um, that, that is uh, uh, that is correct in the uh, when it comes to traditional uh, securities which are not covered by Mika but indeed by uh, by the traditional markets uh, regulation that is indeed correct the pilot does not uh, cover this uh, you are you are right indeed that is something so it would be interesting to discuss a bit further uh, whether uh, there is a need actually for for possible additional adjustments here it's not something which came out strongly at the time in our consultation but uh, but very happy to discuss further. Yeah. The environmental impact, is that a consideration? Is it eventually even a risk? And um, what do you Absolutely say about that? Absolutely, it is. I mean, I think the energy consumption of uh, some, I have to say, certain, uh, uh, let's say, the, uh, DLT-based projects, certain crypto assets is quite uh, level guessing. Uh, I think there are other uh, projects which have a much better, actually, uh, uh, much better, uh, let's say, uh, energy, uh, energy uh, let's say, energy profile, if you want. Um, and so I think uh, our, our perspective on this is that we need to make sure we need to promote actually those technologies which are less energy consuming. I think, uh, for example, uh, the proof of stake and proof of work are two different approaches here, which uh, have very different profiles in that respect. And so our uh, idea on this is actually to uh, uh, indeed, you know, we have uh, the uh, whole area of sustainable finance, uh, you know, we have a taxonomy actually, which defines sustainable financial activities. So our idea on, on this is actually to, uh, to also distinguish here. We, we need to distinguish uh, DLT technologies which are actually sustainable, which are green, uh, and, and those which are not. I think uh, it is not something which is inherent in DLT that it is necessarily more energy consuming than traditional system. Let's not forget also traditional systems are, uh, I mean, require a lot of energy. They are basically uh, based on, uh, on ICT and, uh, and uh, they have a footprint basically. So we need to make sure that indeed uh, on traditional and on blockchain actually the most energy efficient uh, technologies are being promoted. Yeah. You already asked a part of the, of the next question is, do you see a, a competition between regulated, non-regulated asset classes? Do you see a, a competition between good regulation, a, a lesser regulation for, for business? What do you see the, 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 the competitive landscape is going to look like? Um, I think it, 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 it depends. Like if you if you do competition analysis, you know that there are always there are different markets. You need to define your relevant markets, basically, who is in competition to whom. And I think 
in, in one part, indeed, when it comes to more traditional financial markets, also institutional investors, I think probably completely unregulated instruments will uh, will have a quite hard uh, a quite hard time over uh, over time. Um, then uh, you have another space which will always remain completely unregulated, and that we've seen it will be will be small, but it will exist. And then there will be what is in the middle, indeed, where there may be indeed certain level of competition. I mean, I think our proposals are clear in the future. If you actively market crypto assets to European uh, actually investors or, or consumers, you need to comply with the with the rules. But of course, uh, this is a I mean uh, the uh, the uh, cyberspace is global, so uh, we uh, I mean our attention is not, and we cannot indeed prevent people on their own initiative to decide that they want to get exposure to third countries and other metrics. Now we have a hundred million uh, dollar question here is, will you see that, that those regulations would be harmonized? Are there any mechanisms which you see are, are, are going to be set in place for that? So in the EU, actually, Mika will fully harmonize uh, um, matters across the globe. Uh, we are working with, uh, uh, with the regulators in various fora, Financial Stability Board on stable coins. Uh, IOSCO, CPISS, uh, CPMI, actually on uh, the more some of the more payments, some of the more securities aspects, we are looking at convergence. But I think there's there is a limit to it because traditional securities legislation is also not uh, extremely convergent across the globe. Actually, the U.S. approach is quite different from other from ours. So uh, uh, there there will I mean there are limits to how how strong the the uh, the global convergence can can become. But we, I think it's important, and we're working on it. Now we have a question towards market infrastructure, DLT. Would you foresee that there is a danger of a parallel regime because uh, the DLT pilot has been prolonged over six years? And, and how can you make sure that the investments made in the market infrastructure are safeguarded? So um, the DLT pilot is only for small scale projects. In that sense, basically, there will never be, there's no risk at all of a parallel uh, situation when it comes really to a, a significant part of the market. The DLT project is accessible both to existing infrastructures and to uh, new entrants. So basically, so to the extent that there's a parallelity, it could, I could see a parallelity in within certain companies actually themselves, basically, that they, uh, they operate a full market infrastructure and then in a DLT base. Basically. That I could see. And I think that uh, I would not have any issues with. I think actually I would, I would rather welcome it. On a, on a post authorization supervision, the ECB has recently had an opinion on Mika and called for greater powers to, to supervise on a financial stability oversight perspective. What, what are your views on that? Yeah, I think I already addressed it before that in the sense uh, the ECB has asked indeed uh, to make sure if they say no uh, uh, for monetary policy reasons, then it should not be authorized. And I, I, in, in practice, that is, I mean, the result which we would uh, be getting at, I guess. I mean, I don't see an authorization against the opinion of a central bank. Yeah. Uh, here we have a practitioner. Why would anyone issue e-money token as you can easily avoid regulation by referencing to more than the assets, for example, with 90, 90% euro and 1% US dollar? And um, mm -hmm. um, though you can arbitrage. And uh, the second question fr from that uh, participant is, could consumers trade on these market structures? Um, I mean, whether consumers can trade on these market structures or not, it, it would be the same situation as today. So you know how it is, uh, what are the rules indeed? So that would be quite similar. similar. Um, uh, the question of, uh, let's say, circumvention is, 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 a, is, a, is a key one, and it's also a very difficult one, because uh, let's say in the traditional regulation, we have very clear categories. Something is a payment instrument, it's a security, it's an investment fund, the other thing. I think what we're seeing in this space here is actually that the different functions are blurring every now and then. And uh, that, of course, uh, puts the, the regulator who needs to classify and kind of box things in certain, to apply certain rules into problems. So we are working actually on, on, uh, on, on this, precisely this area. This is, uh, so if you are basically uh, uh, having 90, 90% euro, 1% US dollar in our rules, you would uh, be an asset reference token actually in our proposal. You would still have quite strict rules applying actually, uh, uh, but you would not be subject to one to one redemption right. Uh, but that is also the question how it can even apply. I mean, if you basically, uh, if you are not 100% in, uh, in, in, in one currency, what is then the reference point of the one-to-one -one resumption, right? And what kind of, do you get the money you paid at the beginning, but then it's not, then it's not really uh, an asset reference token. Then you're really uh, referencing to the initial currency. 
or do you get back the market value actually of the different uh, uh, parts of the token? So it's a quite complicated question. Really. Question. So do you see in future an ETF on BTC? Sorry, I didn't uh, get do, that. Do you, do you see in future that we will see a regulated yeah. BTC ETF? Uh, I don't know that we will see uh, that markets will show basically. Yeah. Uh, are there any plans to go to the direction that Liechtenstein went, that we will have crypto laws regarding civil and property law aspects of crypto assets? I think that's a matter for member states. Uh, uh, the civil laws in Europe are not harmonized. Uh, I know that uh, Germany is just uh, finalizing their law on the electronic security. And uh, I think those are matters which are primarily indeed for the member states. We have, uh, I mean, in, the idea of harmonized civil laws in Europe has been around for a long time. Uh, and some people think if we move into the digital age, then it will be easier. Uh, that's not our assessment. Even in the digital age, the issues are the same. So I think that's something which member states need to sort out. Yeah. And uh, again, we have a fraction here. In a sense, since the progress of DLT tends to be measured in months or weeks, why don't you throw the conclusions from the pilot regime faster? Shouldn't we move quicker on that one? And couldn't the pilot regime be made more flexible and adjust dynamically in volumes, instruments, and participants to move from there? We can always draw conclusions faster, uh, but we also get from market participants, if we tell them right now only, uh, you can do this only for two years, it would probably not, for many of them, it would not be worth the investment actually. You need, also need a certain legal certainty actually. That's why I think this period is good. If we have conclusions earlier, we can always draw them earlier, but uh, who uses the pilot will know at least for this period of five, six years, you, you will have certainty that the rules stay as they are. Mm -hmm. Why why are ART is not regulated as investment funds or a certificate? If something is an investment fund and if it's covered by the existing regulation, that will also be the case in the future. If you want, you can see this MICA on ART. You can see it as a circumvention uh, rule, as a, a regulation which captures those cases which are not actually uh, coming into the existing rules. But the moment you fulfill the functions and the definitions of the existing rules on investment funds, you're covered by those. So two last questions, and thanks very much for really speeding up. You've, you're doing great. Thank you very much. Utility tokens continue to escape regulation. Is that correct? Uh, no, utility tokens would be one of the categories of the general crypto assets covered by, uh, by Mika. That means you need to put up a white paper and the service providers, uh, the wallet providers and others, they would be subject to uh, re regulation. The only difference, the only nuance is if it is a non-fungible token, and we discussed that before with the real estate uh, token, then it's a different thing because then we don't see financial markets even potentially uh, uh, developing and then there's no point in applying all this regulation. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last question, I think a lot of it you already answered. So you can very, very well make that your summary remark. What do you think about the recently proposed amendments for an ECP authorization uh, under MECA for asset reference tokens? So uh, I already mentioned that uh, there's, there, there are a couple of ideas around. One is that the ECB need, a central bank needs to have a binding opinion. And uh, I think uh, that is, we discussed that before. Uh, if, the ECB, if the central bank feels uh, this is a threat, then uh, probably there shouldn't be an authorization. Uh, I think another question is who is the authority who actually supervises these, uh, these uh, stable coins, if you want. And there, I think uh, something to keep in mind is that the ECB is responsible for the Eurozone. But what we are having here is, of course, an internal market. That means with passporting. That means if you are actually issuing your project in any of the 27 member states, you are able to actually distribute it across all member states. And that's why, from our perspective, the European Banking Authority is better placed for this because they have powers across all 27 member states. Maybe in the future, if the Eurozone will further expand, this problem will go away. I think then we can surely look at this again. But uh, right now, I think uh, uh, the wisest solution is indeed uh, to, to look at the European Banking Authority, because otherwise you create, again, kind of issues of unlevel playing field or supervisory arbitrage between the Eurozone and other member states. And that would also not be very advisable. Jan Greisens, what a right. You gave us 60 minutes of compact knowledge. Thank you very much. You've been doing great. Uh, just one of the participants wrote excellent sessions. Thank you both. Uh, there is not much more to add. It's been great having you here. I hope very much that it's not the last time. It's certainly to be continued. Thank you very much to take up that pace this morning. Ladies Thank and gentlemen. You. 
thank you very much. And I hope, of course, there will be many projects in Frankfurt in this space uh, in the future. So uh, good luck with that. We certainly will. Take care. All the best. Bye for now.